Does my work really matter to God? In short, the answer is yes. Um, when the story of the Bible begins in Genesis 2, God places the man and the woman in the garden with a job. And he charges them to cultivate and keep it. So from the very beginning, God's one of God's purposes for mankind was to reflect his glory um, at work in creation. And um, that hasn't changed. Even now, the jobs that we have can be split up into that cultivate, keep kind of dichotomy, whether it's jobs of production or jobs of stewardship. But in that, um, we're meant to um, give glory to God by the way that we do those things. But as we know, in Genesis 3, everything breaks and crumbles. Um, our relationship with God breaks and our relationship with each other, mankind breaks. And also our relationship to work breaks. Now, the very ground that we are supposed to cultivate rebels against us and we have to work really hard in, to, in order to get even less done. And we feel that no, no matter who you are, um, there are times when your job just feels hard. And that's because of the fall. The good news of the gospel is that when Jesus redeems you, he brings you back into his story. And he actually allows you to be a storyteller with him again. And he doesn't just re redeem uh, you in relationship to him, which he does. He doesn't just redeem you in relationship to other people, which he does, but he also redeems our relationship to work and allows us to be those storytellers again. So now Jesus is now in you and you are now in him and you bring him into the workplace with you. So your work tells the story of the goodness and the glory of God. So if you're a nurse, you, you should be a nurse to the excellence and glory of God because it's showing off God's care for people. If you are a part of a custodial staff, you are showing the stewardship that God has for his very creation. If you are in law enforcement or a judge or a lawyer, any of those type of jobs, you show that God is a just and good and benevolent judge. Psalm 19, 1 and 2 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and their expanse declares the works of his hand. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. It's saying that all creation was meant to reflect back to him a portion of his glory. And when we're redeemed, we get to go to work and just like the stars of the sky, just like the rest of creation points away from itself and back to its creator, we get to do the very same things in the work that we do. Good morning, church. Thank you for being here with us today. We're excited to gather and sing to the Lord. The words of this song are from Colossians 1, verse 15 through 20. I'm going to invite you to join and sing with us. Will's going to lead us. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. By him all things were created in heaven and earth, seen and unseen. Rulers, dominions, and powers, and kings He holds all things, all things, all things together He holds all things, all things, all things together He's the head of the body, the church Born from the dead So in everything He is the head And the fullness of God Was pleased to dwell In Him to reconcile To Himself All things All things All things together He holds all things All Things were made through him and for him. All things were made. 
He made peace By the blood of His cross He made peace He made peace He made peace By the blood He owns all things All things All things Together By the blood of His cross He made peace Amen. Welcome, friends. I'm Pastor TJ. If Jesus Christ holds all things together, the universe with its vast expanse, I suppose he can hold your life together too. So to all this morning who walked in just tired, maybe even tired of living, to everyone who's deeply sad and wonders, does God really even connect with me? Does he even see me? To everyone who fails, fails to live up to the world's standards, fails to live up to their own standards, and just feels like they keep failing God, to everyone who sins and needs a savior. This church opens wide her doors with a welcome from the savior who holds all things together. Welcome. Now, in just a second, we're gonna stand and we're going to say the Apostles' Creed. Here's the Apostles' Creed. It is standard brand, non-weird, historic Christian declaration of who Jesus is, right? Right now, maybe right now or today, across the world, many people in many different tongues will say the Apostles' Creed out loud. We share this in common with all of normal Christianity, (laughs) and it's been that way for thousands of years now. So, There's a right way and a wrong way to say the Apostles' Creed. The wrong way is without gusto. The right way is with gusto, right? There's a kind of defiance in this. We defy Satan. We defy everything that says that Jesus does not hold all things together, and we belt it out, okay? So let's get after it, all right? So let's stand up. Here we go. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us worship God. No. 
searching for lesser glory turn my eyes and teach my heart teach my
justice has been satisfied He will hold me fast You all can be seated. We're going into our time of prayer here. And this is the confidence that we have. We have confidence that we can, we can come before God and speak to a holy God, not because we can hold ourselves in that moment, and, and not because we think that we have the right combination of words that'll earn God's pleasure and favor, but trusting that our great high priest, he's the one that's holding our, us fast. In Revelation 5, we get fast forwarded into the new heavens and new earth, and uh, we get a glimpse into what things are gonna be like. This is what uh, John says here, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have been made, and you have made them into a kingdom of priests to God, and they shall reign on the earth. We serve a holy God and we, we come before him knowing that we, if we are gonna approach him, it is only by his own grace and goodness because we don't deserve to stand before a God like that. So as I pray for us, why don't you join me in praying? Father, um, we come before you knowing that we are approaching the holy, knowing that you are greater than anything you've created, that because you are, you're worthy of praise. And, and beyond that, you're worthy of our praise, of our worship, because you were slain, not for the righteous, but for sinners, that you would care for us so much that you'd even give of yourself. So Lord, we, we even in that same vein, we pray, knowing our own faults, that as a congregation, collectively, we haven't treated you as we ought. We think that you are pedestrian, that you are common, and you're holy. We think that our sin is acceptable or can be brushed to the side. We don't, we don't reflect the kingdom uh, urgency that you declare to us. We, are, uh, we don't act like the priest that you've declared us to be. We don't love our neighbors as we ought. 
So we need you, O oh God. We thank you that, that your grace really is sufficient. It's sufficient to, to cover our sin. Um, it, it's sufficient to bring us in even now, those that are heavy laden, those that are burdened. You have brought us in for such a time as this. Thank you for that, O oh God. Thank you that, that you would be so gracious as to allow us to hear the preached word again. One more Sunday to sing alongside uh, the saints, that we get to join together. It's a privilege that not everybody gets, so we say thank you. And we pray, oh God, would you, would you cause our congregation, even as it does here, to reflect the complexion of heaven, that people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people group, that as we look at the demographics of our city, we would reflect those demographics that we wouldn't be putting up barriers for, uh, for, for the people in our very neighborhood that we wanna love and serve. Help us, oh God. Help us to be intentional, oh Lord. And we pray that if there are any things in our own personal lives or in, in us congregationally that are putting up any kind of barriers, expose those things to us that we might turn. Ultimately, as we reflect just a portion of the body of Christ, God, we, we want to glorify you in what you've called us to. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we pray, even now, give us ears to hear and give us a heart to, um, to reflect on the very words that we hear. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Um, as we move to our time of giving, as one of the pastors here, I just want to say thank you guys. You guys have no idea behind the scenes the things that we get to do, the people that we get to partner with, and the ways God is moving his kingdom forward through you guys. And if you only knew, you, your heart would rejoice even more than it already does. So as we move to our time and giving, that's, that's the main thing is thank you. Every, every seed of, uh, of gift that you plant into this church um, is ultimately planted into the kingdom of God and is pushing the kingdom forward. And it's gonna bear fruit far beyond your own lifetime. And that's beautiful. That, that, is, that is a different level of return on investment. So as you see here, um, you can give in a few different ways online in the pews as it goes around and whatnot. So all things come from you, O oh Lord, and of your own have we given you.
We're continuing in Colossians. Our text this morning is Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17, and that's on page 984 in the Pew Bible there in the Pew Rack in front of you. While you're turning there, uh, I just want to say thank you to Pastor John for preaching to us last week, and BB's on the horizon. I will not forget that. I think I'm going to take that to the grave. Um, and if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you need to go podcast it. I'm not even going to tell you. It's not going to make no sense until you listen to the sermon. Thank you, brother. We're continuing in our Colossians series this morning, All of Christ for All of Life. Now, why have we called it that? Because Colossians shows us that Jesus makes totalizing claims on our lives. So this morning we sang about how he holds all things together, not half the things, all things. And if we've received Christ Jesus, the Lord, then we've received a whole new life. Now we might go back to the same job the next day, but we'll not go back to the same job, the same person after we receive Jesus. And we'll not go back for the same reasons. And we'll not go back with the same power. Jesus gives us both identity and purpose, and power for living out that purpose. So Colossians is, is how we reorient to the new life that we step into with Jesus. Colossians is basically the light bulbs going off in our heads after we've received Jesus. So Paul's writing to this young church, and he wants them to understand now what it is that they've stepped into, who they are. So this is a very timely book for us. We're a young church, and I think, basically, Jesus is saying to us, oh, you're just getting started. So, Colossians chapter three, verses one to 17. I'll read it now. If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death Therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, 
and obscene talk from your mouth? Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, there's just no way I can preach everything in this text this morning, but I want to hit the high points and leave enough left over for you to dig into and hopefully set you down the right way of thinking about these verses. So I want to take this now under three points, and I've been told that the students are supposed to write these down, so I've given you some good ones. Number one, from verse three, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Number two, some things need to die. From verse five. And number three, put on love and... Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You needed a challenging one. Put on love and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I'm joining these all together for a reason and we'll get to that. So those are my three points. Now, number one, Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, when when Paul gives you a point just as neatly as that, you don't try to improve upon it. That is the whole point of verses one through four. That is the distilled essence of what verses one through four are talking about. But let's notice, first of all, the point of this if-then right at the beginning of verse one. Paul is not here trying to unsettle them by giving them an if-then. Paul's not calling into question their salvation. That's not what kind of if this is. We know that because Paul has already affirmed their faith in Jesus several times and celebrated their salvation. He calls them God's chosen ones. The if-then is not there to unsettle them. It's actually meant to settle them into their new identity. Um, Now, I'll put it to you this way. Have you ever found yourself um, driving to a place that you no longer live? This happens to me all the time. I I, I get off on an exit that I have not lived on in like five years. And and then I'm like, what am I doing here? Because part of me is still on a kind of default mode headed to a place I don't live anymore. And in much the same way, the Apostle Paul is trying to connect the dots for us. This is your new location of identity. Therefore, if, that's the point of the if, if then you live here, don't go here. All right, so he's connecting, he's trying to turn on some lights in the room as to what has actually happened to us. Guys, receiving Jesus is so massive, it's so it's so totalizing. He makes claims on our lives that are so big that, that salvation is a bit like, um, I don't know if any of you, your moms, my mom's over here, this is just great, um, would come in in the morning and flip the light on in your room. 
I find that the most infuriating thing in the world. <laughs> and my mom has the spiritual gift of waking up happy. I do not have that spiritual <laughs> gift. And, and it's like when somebody comes in the room in the morning, they flip on the lights, and the first thing you can see is just sort of like your, you know, your eyebrows or something stuck, your, your eyelashes just kind of stuck together. And then you realize like, okay, I can see the end of my bed, and you're kind of just squinting, you know, it's so bright. And then eventually, you know, you can, act, you can actually see somewhere. And then you're ready to go somewhere. You may not be happy about it, but you can see. When Jesus comes into our lives and he flips on the light switch of faith, of being alive to God, we don't just see everything at once. We, we grow by degrees. So there, there are things in our experience now that, uh, that are not going to be there 20 years from now, or hopefully maybe even sooner. So the Apostle Paul is connecting these dots here for us. And so when he says, if then you've been raised with Christ, he's actually hearkening back to something that he's already described. So let's, in order to understand that phrase, raised with Christ, we have to look back where he defined what that means, raised with Christ. So chapter 2, beginning um, in verse 12. We'll just jump right into the middle of it. What does Paul mean when he says raised with Christ? Chapter 2 and verse 12, you can look back with me. It's on the screen. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So to be raised with Christ is to have faith in the powerful working of God. Now, what does that mean? What did God powerfully, what, what is it that God did with his power that we have faith in? God canceled the record of debt. That is, it's as if God has a, a, a file folder with your name on it in heaven, and inside of that file folder is, is a record of your debt of trespasses and sins, not just things you did, but things you, you ought to have done that you didn't do. All of your indebtedness to God, all of the, you were born into a world in which you did not acknowledge God as God. You lived for your own glory, even in the good things you did. And God counts that as debt to him. What did God do with his power? He canceled the record of that debt that stood against us with its legal demands. There are repercussions for sinning against God. How did he do that? This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Now, the Apostle Paul here is, is playing on this idea. He's, he's trying to demonstrate just how, just how forgiven you actually are. When someone was crucified, there was a, a plaque that was put up of wood on their cross that had their name and the charge against them, the reason they were being crucified, so that whenever anybody walked by, they could look up at that plaque or that, that sign and know why that person was being crucified. It was both a deterrent that the Romans used to keep people from doing that thing again, and actually it showed that justice has been served, so you knew that you lived in a place where justice was done. This was a safe place. God is saying, the Romans nailed something to Jesus' cross. Actually, Matthew tells us, Matthew says they nailed up the charge above him. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. But Paul says, God nailed something else to the cross. It said, Jesus, my only begotten son. And what was nailed next to it was your record of debts. So that anyone walking by, namely God looking down, could see that the reason Jesus was crucified was your debt. He nailed it to the cross. So guys, on that great and final day when you stand before God and God opens up the file folder with your name on it, do you know what he's not going to find there? A record of debt. It's gone. You, you died. 
you died with Christ. If then you have been raised with Christ, do you feel the force of it now? You don't live anymore. You live in Christ. You're united to him. So God, therefore, it's what he means in verse three in our text when he says, you're hidden with Christ in God. You're safe. God, let me just press in here for a second. Let's put up uh, chapter three. You're hidden with Christ. I looked up this verb this week. Do you know what it means? To hide. (laughs) You're expecting something profound, weren't you? It means to hide. Just stop and think about that for a minute. Your life, not the, just the beating of your heart, not just what your body feels, your life. When someone says to you, oh, you know, when they're, maybe they're talking about, I don't know, skydiving or something that people do for fun, and they say, oh, that's living. What do they mean in that moment? They don't mean that, 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 that that's like what the body does to live. They mean like that's what life is all about, right? Is that rush or whatever it is. Your life, the life of the thing that makes life life to you is hidden with Christ in God. If God hides it, nobody's going to get it. What's the whole point of that? The point of that is, guys, you can live because no one can take your life, you can take risks. You don't have to walk the world tentatively wondering what's gonna happen to me. No one can touch your life. You can defy an emperor. Why? Because no one can get at your life. It's hidden with Christ in God. You are those who've already died and you've already been raised. It's as if we've entered into the very heart of Jesus so that when he went down into death, you went with him so that when God raised him from the dead, it wasn't just Jesus that he raised from the dead. It was you in Jesus. Some of us know what it's like to feel as if part of our heart is already gone to the next world because we've lost someone that we love dearly. And this world will never really be home to us again because we can't hold those people anymore. And just so, all who have received Christ are hidden in the heart of Christ. The reason our future is secure is that Jesus Christ has hidden us away in his heart and he will not rest until we are living with him. So maybe you're thinking, you know, TJ, I haven't died yet. Um, I haven't been resurrected yet. I don't have a glorified body yet. I don't yet see Jesus with my eyes. So how is it that I've been raised with Christ? Guys, Time is not of the essence. Jesus is of the essence. Time can do nothing to change what Jesus had declared he's going to do. So when the Apostle Paul speaks of your future, he speaks of it as your present because the one who holds your future secure is the one who invented this thing we call time. So you are secure now, as secure as you will ever be. And maybe you don't feel that way. Actually, maybe you're wondering, TJ, how do I know that my debts have been canceled? I mean, he says that we're God's chosen, but how do I, how do I know that I'm chosen? What if I'm not chosen? Well, will you die with him? Will you trust your future to him? Will you trade in your identity for his identity? If you will, then he has already willed. 
If you will trust Jesus, then Jesus has already inclined your heart to trust him. So the thing to do, friends, when we're wondering, am I God's chosen, is stop looking at ourselves and start looking to Jesus and to his cross. That's why the Apostle Paul is going to land on, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Christianity is all about looking away from the self to Christ. Or maybe another way to say it is looking to Christ, looking at ourselves through Christ. The Apostle Paul is locating our identity out where it cannot be touched. So why not pray to Jesus right now? Why not just say to him, Jesus, be my Lord. You can do that. This moment is no less of God or no more of God than tomorrow will be. The question is not how do you feel right now. The question is who is God right now? Is he the God that nails our debts to the cross of his son or isn't he? Is he the God that receives sinners or isn't he? You could be the worst sinner in Nashville, Tennessee. I hope you are. Because you'll just glorify his grace all the more. You can receive Jesus today. They did. And all of those things that the Apostle Paul is telling them to turn away, turn away from, he says, in these you once walked. So, Maybe you're walking in those things. Well, chapter two and verse six, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, you can receive Jesus today. Not because you are so worthy of his grace, but because he keeps his promises. And if you have been raised with Christ then, you're ready to seek the things that are above. So, I don't want to move on too quickly. If you have not been raised with Christ, then what what I'm about to, you know, by God's grace, expound here is not for you. In other words, seeking the things that are above are for people who actually have a share in the things that are above. But if you don't, then you need to receive Jesus. Because all that that comes after this, guys, you know, uh, actually putting off um, the, the old self putting on the new self is contingent upon ha- having believed on Jesus. But if you have believed on Jesus, then you are ready to seek the things that are above, no matter how you feel, no matter how you know, entry level you, of a Christian you think that you are. And how do we do that then? How do we seek things that are above where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God? Verses five to 11, let's look at them. Some things need to die. It's not just one or the other. It's not just putting to death one thing or and it's not just um, putting on the other. It's both and at the same time. We, we're both putting something off and we're putting something on or putting something to death and receiving this other life in its place. Verses five to 11, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Now, there's an activity involved in this, put to death. When the Apostle Paul says, put to death what is earthly in you, he doesn't mean, he's not preaching against the body or preaching against the earth, you know, like the actual physical creation. The Apostle Paul is the very one who actually tells us in 1 Timothy that God richly provides everything for us to enjoy. So the Apostle Paul is not against the enjoyment of creation. The, The creation is amazing. What does he mean by earthly. When he says earthly, he means the way that this fallen world thinks about God and therefore acts toward God and one another. In other words, he's talking about the native instincts that we have before we're raised to life with Christ. The world basically says, get your best life now and do whatever it takes. And that's the mentality that Paul calls earthly or other places he calls it worldly. So sexual immorality, impurity, passion, that is, he doesn't mean passion as in like, you know, being, being passionate about something. He means that it living unreasonably, you know, like a soap opera. You put on a soap opera, I don't know, I only watched a couple of them, and you just think to yourself, this is crazy. It's just like, it's like what you do if you don't think and you just believe every emotion that comes into your mind, you know, like, 
It's, un, it's an unthinking way of just living the, out the kind of visceral reactions of the flesh to just whatever comes our way. Evil desire. Covetousness. I mean, who doesn't understand that? Which is idolatry. That is, it's setting up something else in place of God. And then in verse 8, anger. Right, there's a place for a right kind of anger. Be angry and sin not. But he means basically living as if we are, guys, you'll never be so angry as when you think you actually control reality because nobody's ever going to get in line with you. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, man, obscene talk, do not lie to one another. Isn't that striking? He just stops in the middle of this thing and tells us not to lie to one another? I mean, what kind of people have to be told not to lie to one another? In all of these things, we're talking about ways of living. We're talking about practices. You know, he says, in which you once walked, but now you've put them away. Um, the practices. So these are not, the Apostle Paul is getting at our actual, how, how we actually live in this world. And he's not, he's not giving a kind of total list. He's not saying like, okay, you know, go down through this list and if you don't find it on this list, you don't have to worry about it. But as long as you take care of these things, then you're gonna be good. This is kind of just like a sampling. And he's, and he's, he's obviously mentioning things that they can relate to because he says you once walked in them. But here's the whole point, verse 10. Having put on the new self, right? Having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. In other words, we know how to change when we know who God is. So God is not the kind of God that says one thing and does another, so we don't lie, right? Because God doesn't do that, and um, so we don't want to do that. I know a dad um, who's a friend of a friend, um, of a, he's, he's a dad of young, young boys, and one day one of his sons got in the, in the car after coming home from school where he had just learned a really new creative word, uh, an expletive, and he tried it out on his dad because, you know, he didn't know that it wasn't cool to do that. And um, I don't, I'm never going to forget this because this dad did something so wise, and it says a lot actually about the character of this dad. His son, you know, said the word, worked it into a sentence, and, uh, and he, he, he said, Wait, did you learn that word at school today? Yeah, yeah. And he said, well, we are not the kind of men that use words like that. And his son said, oh, okay. He never had to say another thing. Why? Because he revered his dad and he wanted to be the kind of man his dad was. Because if, if we haven't been made alive to Christ, then the instruction of Christ just means nothing to us. But if we've been renewed, if we've been raised with Christ, then the, when God looks at us and says, we're not the kind of people that do that, we say, oh, I'm not doing that again. At the deepest core of our being, we're no longer defined by our ethnicity or our socioeconomic class or our Christian lineage. Jesus is our identity. That's the whole point of all this stuff at the end here. Doesn't it seem kind of odd to you? Like, why is, why is he all of a sudden talking about Greeks and Jews and circumcision and uncircumcision? Because he's talking about how we actually change. We don't change by getting a new list of rules. We change by getting a whole new identity. And from that identity, we actually, we actually want to do what God wants us to do. So there's not Greek and Jew. In other words, these are the, in this, this is just a sampling. These are the classic divides in that culture. You know, the holy people, the not so holy people, the ignorant people, the word barbarian literally comes from, from a kind of way of mocking a certain group of people. 
They, they didn't know how to speak well. So, so the Greeks, they, they, the Greeks said they sound like ba, 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 ba. So they called them barbarians, right? So even the word barbarian is a kind of slander of this particular people group. And of those people, the Scythians were the worst. I mean, there are Greek plays that basically make fun of the Scythians. They're this is kind of the pundits of, of these plays. They're like, I don't know, they're like the worst rednecks you've ever seen or something. And, and, and the Apostle Paul is saying, in Christ... All of those identities are given up for this. Christ is all and in all. That's why every attempt to adopt the ethics of Jesus without union with Jesus will fail. We cannot live and love like Jesus until Jesus is our identity, until we've been raised with him. But when we have put on Jesus Christ by faith, when we've actually received deeply our new identity, then we actually begin to root sin out of our lives, to kill it entirely. Those things that don't belong to our new identity. Guys, some things have to be put to death. They're not just going to fall off. There's an activity to this, okay? And, and versus what is about to come in the next section. There's an activity to killing sin. John Owen, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. So there's a warfare. Now, in, in Islam, of course, there's, there's two warfares. There's the jihad, the war against the world, and there's the jihad, the war on the inside. But in Christianity, there's only one war. There's the war on the inside that's, that's raged both against the, the unseen beings and against the self, all right? So sometimes I'm, I'm tempted because Satan's tempting me, but the Bible is very realistic. It says that when, oftentimes, when I'm tempted, it's because I want to do it. I'm drawn away by my own lust. So when Jesus comes up, actually takes up residence in our heart, when we get this new identity, guys, we find a kind of tension there that wasn't there before, a kind of hatred, really. So when someone comes to me and, and, and they're in the depths of despair because they keep doing a thing that they don't want to do, I don't really worry about that person because they don't want to do it. But when someone comes to me and they just seem to have no sense of being torn apart by a sin that, that they are, are stuck in, I worry tremendously about them. I worry, are they gonna make it? I worry, do they even know Jesus? Guys, I don't wanna lose a single sheep put in my charge as a pastor. The only way I can sleep at night is because I'm the under shepherd. So when I see some of us flirting with things that will steal our souls is I worry. I worry for you. The heart is deceitful. You need to make war against those things that tend to pry your affections away from Jesus. Don't make peace with porn. And don't just Stop looking at porn. Do something even better. Make war on it. You see what I'm saying? Don't just, don't just take something away. Go to war against the evil things that tend to pry your heart away from Jesus. If you have influence in a business that does business with the porn industry, use your influence to take it down. Right? I'm probably calling down all kinds of wrath right now from the world. I don't care. If you have a voice to speak out against injustice, use it. Don't make peace with it. Amen. Guys, especially you dads with daughters, we don't have to grow up in a world with porn anymore. Right? We don't have to put up with it. The reason that... The reason that we, we, we feel like we're tiptoeing around all kinds of things that are dangerous to our soul is because we've not been active. So I just, I just want to lean in here. I can't circle it enough. Put to death. Go to war. You'll never regret it. And you'll find it's much easier to resist the devil when you just start punching him.
So, that's what we put off. That's what we put to death. But the universe abhors a vacuum. You can't just put to things to death. You got to put something on. <laughs> and it's really striking the language here. Look at verses um, 12 to 17 now with me. This is my long title. Put on love and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly from verses 14, 15, and 16. This is one package reality. One of the things we don't want to do to Colossians is, is, is try to take one line and build a whole theology on it. Just we take it in these chunks. This is a package. Put on then. So in the same way that Paul says to put to death, he tells us to put something on. And notice here that every, everything in here is couched in the context of community. In other words, the Apostle Paul is not envisioning a kind of Christianity where, you know, you live out on this island and, and you, what you do is just cultivate like internal virtues that don't have anything to do with anybody else. That kind of Christianity doesn't exist. The kind of Christianity that's actually real is the kind that lives in close enough proximity for the Apostle Paul to say things like bearing with one another. Aren't you glad that's in the Bible? The Bible is so realistic. So just let me, let me lean in here for just a second. We have to have this category. This is important to our future as a church. We have to have this category in our minds if we're going to make it together as a cohesive community, the way that Jesus wants us to. Just because someone is hard to deal with just because someone is annoying, all right, there's a lot of annoying people in church. They were annoying before they became Christians, all right? That's just that's the way it is. I'm not annoyed by any of you, but I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm sure that I annoy you in some way. I'm probably a constant annoyance to some of you. But that doesn't mean, just because we're annoyed doesn't mean that we've been sinned against, we need a real healthy category for bearing with one another. We need to know and expect that in Christ Jesus, especially in Christ Jesus, because he loves to save all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds that, as D.A. Carson says, are natural-born enemies, that in Christ Jesus, even in a really healthy church, we're going to have to bear with one another. And if we're not having to bear with anyone, are we even in a real church? If everyone here has all my same taste, all my same social awarenesses, such that I, and I never have to bear with anyone, how do I know that I've entered into the reality that Paul is describing? How do I know I'm not just in a country club? Expect to bear with one another and expect to have to forgive. Guys, we're gonna step on one another because we're sinners Jesus is not looking out over Nashville, Tennessee and saying, now, who are the people I can call together that will really get along? There's all kinds of people in the church. It's part of the beauty of it. The church is a living argument that something from outside of this world has entered into human experience. Only Jesus can pull together Scythians and Gentiles and Jews and Greeks and the philosophers and the slaves. Who else can do that? So we're going to offend one another. And the proof that we're really the people of God is not that we don't sin against each other. It's that we forgive one another. So how can we sum it all up? Paul does it for us in verse 14. Look at it. This is striking. And above all else, wow, when the Apostle Paul says, above all else, above all these, we tune in. Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now, I know it sounds a little bit like a hippie song, but it's not. What does that mean? It means that the, the intuition of love is kindness and humility and meekness and patience. There's this, there's a selfish way to be kind. There's a selfish way to be humble. It's not real humility, but it, you know, it looks like it on the surface. That's why the Apostle Paul is saying, he, he gives this big category, put on love. Because love is the activity of 
all of these virtues. In other words, love builds up. Ray Ortland Sr. says somewhere, I love this, that the greatest Christian sin, he thought, is withheld love. We're not called merely to not offend one another. We're actually called to love one another. Love builds up. Love walks into church and thinks, <laughs> in as much as I'm able, every person I talk to today is going to walk away more encouraged in the Lord. Not because, you know, we get brilliant things to say, but because we're actually going to love them. We're going to look at them and we're going to want what's best for them. Even if it means saying hard things, love warns. It's, it's the same Paul that tells us all these amazing things that also says that the wrath of God is coming. But, but guys, when we just receive the love of Jesus and put on the love of Jesus such that we're actually able to give to people without sucking the life out of them because we don't need anything from them. We actually, we actually have bandwidth to give to them when we just do that, then, the, 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 uh, as Paul would say, the whole body grows, it builds itself up in love. Ephesians and Colossians are like, you know, kissing cousins. So if you're looking for, uh, the, you know, context for Colossians, you go to Ephesians. So we can just move in and out of them. So when he wants to talk about the new practices of of the church, notice in verse 15 and 16 that he doesn't use the language of drumming things up. In other words, it's different from when he says put to death. When he wants to talk about how love gets into our experience, he has to use the language of letting. Isn't that striking? And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And be thankful, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In other words, we don't get into this love by drumming it up from the inside. We get into it by letting it in from the outside. Jesus is actively moving towards us with his love. And if we want to get in on it, if we want to put on love, it's not a matter of willpower. It's actually a matter of openness. Openness to God. We don't get there by hyper-focusing on one another. We get there by hyper-focusing on Jesus. How do we do that? Verses 15 and 16, these are one in the same reality. So the Apostle Paul is not giving sort of like two ways. He's describing the, a, a whole total package here. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. So by letting the word of Christ, that is scripture, dwell in us richly, we, we actually begin to receive the love, we, we hardly even realize what's happening to us, but by dwelling in the word of Christ, we actually begin to receive the love of God deep down in our hearts in a way that we, we don't even really understand. It's mysterious. A healthy church has bibline blood. It has, the, it has the Bible running through its veins and animating everything that it does. So the words of Christ, that is scripture. We know in Luke chapter 24, G, the resurrected Jesus appears to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And the text actually says that beginning with the prophets, so beginning back in the, in the Old Testament, Jesus shows them all the things concerning himself in the Old Testament. So the Bible is the word of Christ period. All right, so when, when we read here the word of Christ, we're talking about the Bible. So the words of Christ are the words of the Bible. And when Paul says, you know, let them dwell in you richly, he, he's, he's saying basically operate out of this place of, of the Bible. I mean, I love it when I get into a conversation with someone and uh, the first time I ever met John, John Farmer, I'll never forget this, um, we were talking about his call to ministry, and I remember, it wasn't as if he had like a, a note card there or something, but scripture poured out of him. It's one of the reasons I knew this is the man. Like, whatever it costs, we need this guy. He said, he was describing his own call, and right in the middle of it, he said, who is sufficient for these things? It was the words of Paul dwelling in John's heart, just coming out for the, the right moment when the words of Christ get deep down into our heart 
they actually change the way that we navigate reality. So if you feel that the peace of Christ does not rule in your heart, you don't get the peace of Christ ruling in your heart by retreating somewhere and thinking nice thoughts about Jesus. You get it by letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. If you like to write in your Bible, please don't do it in the pew Bible, though you could. You should draw a line connecting verse 16 to verse 2. Because when we set our minds on things that are above, what we're actually doing is letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly. In other words, there is no way to set your mind on the things of Christ, to seek the things that are above, unless, unless you have the Bible. The words of Christ, the Bible, is, is, is the source of our conversation. It's the way that we know how to pray. The Bible is our preaching at Emmanuel. The Bible is our coaching at Emmanuel. The Bible is our wisdom at Emmanuel. The Bible is even our singing at Emmanuel. Isn't it amazing? It is, I'm just floored by this. Of, of all the, if, you, if you had said, you know, and be thankful and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, um, and, if, and you just stop right there and said, TJ, what do you think Paul's going to say next? I would not guess singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I'm not just leaning in here because we're in Nashville. I mean, this is just striking to me, though. It, but it ought, I mean, if anybody ought to resonate with this, is surely it's us. As if I'm like a musician, you know, just talking like I'm, like I'm so Nashville. With thankfulness in your hearts to God, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I love that. The Bible actually... It, it's not, the Bible is not just for teaching. The Bible is for rejoicing. All right, so, you know, when you sit down with your friends over dinner, the Bible is for that moment. The words of Christ are for that moment. When you're, you know, if you have a child, when your child is born, the Bible is for that moment. Guys, on your wedding night, the Bible is for that moment. The words of Christ are the words of life that inform us everything that we do. The nearer we get to the words of Christ, the more alive we become. So if the Bible right now in our thinking is this kind of just Sunday reality, then we don't really know what the Bible's for. What if the Bible, all right, what if the Bible was actually for our enjoyment? <laughs> like, there's a novel idea, right? William Tyndale says that the gospel is good, glad, and joyful news that makes a man happy and I think makes his heart sing with joy, something like that. I just butchered it. Page 15 of Ray's green book, The Gospel. <laughs> if there's not something of the joy of Christ in our reading of the Bible, then we're not reading it right. So I'm not here to shame you into reading your Bible. I'm saying, do you like joy? Well, that's what the Bible's for. And it's just so fitting that Paul would sort of close us off here with singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs because there's nothing so absurd in human experience as singing. You don't have to do it. I mean, we could just get up and say this stuff that we say in songs, you know. It wouldn't have the same effect, would it? It's so human. Nothing else in the world sings except for us. I love the way, I'll go ahead and call the band up now. Scripture is for singing. Uh, shameless plug here. The band, of course, we were all a part of this live recording of Romans chapter 8, where the band took Romans 8 and put it to song. And we're going to give those out, we're going to give copies of those out at Carol Fest, which is sometime in December. I'm really on top of things. Um, and here's why I'm excited about that. Romans 8 is maybe the most densely hopeful section of the whole Bible. And if you put that together with this absurdly joyful thing called singing that is so human and so peculiar and so of God, I think what you get is a kind of just, 
explosion of joy waiting to happen. So come get those two CDs, you know, um, and then give them to somebody. Spread the joy. So if, if singing to you is just a kind of, I don't know, sidebar thing that doesn't really matter that much, then you got a real problem with the Apostle Paul and with Martin Luther. I'll close with Luther. I love the way he says this. There is no doubt that there are many seeds of good qualities in the minds of those who are moved by music. Those, however, who are not moved, I believe are definitely like stumps and blocks of stone. For we know that music is odious and unbearable to the demons. Indeed, I plainly judge and do not hesitate to affirm that except for theology, there is no art that could be put on the same level with music. Since except for theology, music alone produces what otherwise only theology can do, namely a calm and joyful disposition. Manifest proof of this is the way the devil the creator of saddening cares and disquieting worries, takes flight at the sound of music almost as he takes flight at the word of theology. This is the reason why the prophets did not make use of any art except music. When setting forth their theology, they did it not as geometry, not as arithmetic, not as astronomy, but as music, so that they held theology and music most tightly connected and proclaimed truth through psalms and songs. My love for music, which often has quickened me and liberated me from great vexations, is abundant and overflowing. Guys, we're gonna sing now. And why don't we take this first song to just sit and receive the words of this passage of Scripture put to song, and then Jess will stand us for the next one. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Set your minds on things that are above, That are on earth, set your minds on Christ.
praise God. Let's stand and sing together. Isn't that great? We're not stumps. <laughs> Just mere rocks. But we are ones who can lift up our voice and give praise. That's a powerful word today that we heard through song, through the word of God, and the voices that we have to give praise to God. So thank you for being part. I'm Scott Thomas, one of the pastors here, and I want to give you a couple of quick things. One is, we have a Connect card in the rack in front of you, and those are, can also be put in later. If you said, like, I'd like, to, I'd like to say something, I'd like to communicate, put a prayer request, put some information. So what, what do you do with these now? Fill those out. And then we have orange boxes, two sets on each exit door. You can put those in there and uh, our deacons and such. You know what? We pray as a staff every single Tuesday morning, we pray specifically for every one of these that come in. 
And it's our privilege and our honor. And we get to do this. So put those back in there. We would really, really appreciate that so very much uh, doing that. And then TJ mentioned about the uh, Carol Fest that's coming up. And he said, sometime in December, y'all show up. (laughs) But you can have that information by the Emmanuel Guide. (laughs) Okay, so we hand these out. They're different every week. And on here, I had to actually check and see what day it was myself. Oh, it's December 6th. So um, that's where you'll find all that information. Please don't just, these are for your communication uh, that we have for you. Now, we're going to have a guest reception that's going to be right after here in our cafe. And the pastors will be there. And if you're new or newish, and would like to come and meet with us, that'd be great. But one other thing we're inviting you to do, if you have a prayer need, and you know, want to really take this up another level, we would interrupt us. Um, we're there for you. So just step right in and say, hey, can you pray with me about something? And we'd love to be able to do that uh, for you. So now our benediction for today, and the benediction is God's blessing down upon us And in Scripture, there's even Aaron, when he gave the benediction, raised out a hand and gave it. And so that's what we do, is we raise out our hand in receiving this benediction. And I want to read one to you right from Scripture in Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.